Glory Cloud Podcast, episode 138. Well, stay tuned for some more God, Heaven, and Harmageddon this week. Welcome back to another episode of the Glory Cloud Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cahi, and I'm joined by our co-host, Pastor Todd Bordeaux of Cornerstone Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Houston, Texas. Welcome back, Todd. Thanks, Chris. How you been? You know, I'm doing all right. I'm looking forward to talking more about God, Heaven, and Armageddon. Uh, How are you doing? Ready for the same. (laughs) Good. So I'll keep the housekeeping brief, just reminding our listeners that we do have our show notes page over at meredithkline.com slash podcast. There you can find all of the resources that we mentioned during the course of an episode. Uh, We sure would appreciate it if you would give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and to subscribe to the podcast on whatever you use to listen to it. Both of those things really help to boost our visibility to other people who are looking for good theological content in their podcasts. And finally, if you have the means to pitch in a little bit of money to help us cover the monthly cost of hosting the audio files, you can find a donate button at meredithkline.com slash podcast on the right-hand side of the page. And any amount that you can give is very much appreciated and really does encourage Todd and me. So with that, Todd, I'll turn it over to you to kick off the discussion. All right. For those following along in the book, we're on page uh, 120 right now. And Klein is showing the typology of Israel as the um, constructing of Israel as a covenant people is going to picture many things in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. First, we have the coming of the typological kingdom as Israel is gathered together. And like in the actual gospel itself, Israel has been um, saved. They've been redeemed. There's been a judgment, and they've come out the other side. And now there is a national assembly at Mount Sinai. And so there's obvious parallels between that and and we've been redeemed. And right now we worship in heaven. But there will be a gathering when we are finally saved um, from all our enemies and from death. And there will be another national assembly. And so the typological kingdom pictures the coming of the kingdom of Christ in many different ways. And when Israel meets God on Mount Sinai, the Bible uses two basic analogies. First, it's the analogy of marriage, that Israel is a wife. It's it's a marriage ceremony between God and Israel. But there are other analogies that Israel is adopted as a son, depending on where in the Old Testament you read. And sometimes that son is pictured more as a servant. And so you have Israel as wife and Israel as son. But now that they've been redeemed, there's a covenanting that makes them uniquely God's um, nation. And so the book of Exodus, Klein points out, is really divided into two sections. The first half, first chapters 1 through 18, is the story of the covenant mediator, uh, the birth and the calling of Moses and how God, through the mediator, delivers his people. And then in chapters 19 through 50, we have the ratification of the covenant between God and his people. And that basic pattern, Klein points out, you can see in the Gospels. For example, the first part of the Gospels focuses on the covenant mediator, um, how he demonstrates himself to be the Messiah, Um, by his words and actions and his teaching. And then the second part is covenant ratification, how he actually um, ratifies the covenant of grace by his own death and resurrection. Now, what's interesting is uh, from the standpoint of chronology, um, you have almost three years of Christ's life in only the first half of the Gospels. And then you have the last week of Christ's life including the resurrection, is the whole second half of the Gospels. And so you can see that it's, it's very much geared towards these two, uh, this middle point, which is 
Um, now that Christ has proven himself to be the mediator, now he ratifies the covenant as he goes to the cross. That's why so much space is given to that last week of Christ's life. And so when we look at the cut of covenant ratification in Exodus 19 through 50, Klein divides it into three sections. There are the ceremonies of the covenant ratic ratification, which includes the giving of the law and tablets and then the renewal of that after it's initially broken. And then the prescriptions for the tabernacle, how God would live with his people. And then the confirming of the co covenant relationship as the tabernacle is finished, God takes up residence with his people at the end of the book of Exodus. And so both sections, of course, end with God meeting with his people. God meets on Mount Sinai after the first half. And then he meets again in the sense where he um, fills his royal house and he meets with the assembly. So we have those two assemblies also. The point being is, is we have a redemption and then a meeting with God. Now, all typology falls short and there's sometimes you have to contrast. Certainly when we meet with Christ, we're not going to, um, he's not going to institute a new covenant arrangement with us. It's simply the, comp the um, consummation of the covenant of grace. But here, because it's only a type and it's going to picture some other things, um, even after they've been redeemed, there's going to be a covenant ritual and a, a covenant made that can be broken. And so another example that all types fall short and sometimes they're more contrasts. And we've talked about that more as we talked about republication. We'll get more into that later, but any thoughts before we go on? Yeah, I noticed that in this section um, that we're covering in this episode, Klein references uh, his book, Structure of Biblical Authority, a number of times. And, you know, that's what stood out to me as you were discussing this, um, because Klein has a whole chapter in that book where he draws out parallels between the book of Exodus and the Gospels in the New Testament. Um, and he, he even calls the uh the book of exodus the gospel of moses so i thought that was interesting yeah structure is is wouldn't you say it's probably the least known book of Klein's? yeah i think you're probably right and yet that was the my first introduction to meredith was that was the first book i had to read even before king the prologue and there are there's are some very wonderful and and deep riches of covenant and the comparison between the old and new covenant. So I would highly recommend that book. It's not an easy read, but it is um, a wonderful book. Yeah, I agree. Not easy, but but worth the investment in time and, and energy. So as we go on here, this section, uh, Klein calls covenantal constituting. And Klein notes that when the covenant was made with the patriarchs, it was always a covenant made with individuals. God appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He never appeared to the larger covenant community like he only appeared to them. But when he meets with Israel on Sinai, from that point on, um, the nation meets with God, even though the nation is often represented by elders. And so what we have then here is a national covenant. It's not simply the covenant of grace with individuals. There's a national element to a covenant God is making with Israel. Israel would be constituted a holy nation and they will be told they must have a king from their own people who will reign and represent the whole kingdom. And so the Mosaic law comes in the form of an ancient treaty where ancient kings used to make covenants with entire nations they would defeat. And now they would be ruling over. And these covenants very much Klein notes matches in, in many ways the covenants between or the covenant between God and Israel. Now for one, there were duplicate duplicate copies made of the laws of the covenant. So there are two tablets of the law when the Ten Commandments were written. Some have taken that to assume that one tablet had the first five and the second tablet had the second five. That's how it's pictured in um, the Ten Commandments, the famous movie. But Klein suggests that's not the way to look at it, that 
all 10 were on each one, but they were duplicate tablets because that's the way ancient treaties were formed. There would be duplicate copies as witnesses. And sure enough, in the ancient world, Klein notes that after that covenant was written and duplicate, duplicate copies were made, they were enshrined under the feet of whatever deity um, the king ruled in the name of. And so at the temple, um, the, however they wrote it down would be put under the feet of the deity. The gods would be invoked as witnesses and enforcers of the covenant that the nation must keep. And in the same way, God places the testimony, the tablets, he places the Ten Commandments in the ark, which is in a sense the, the feet of deity in the picture that the ark is the picture of the throne of God. And so, and in Deuteronomy, God is evoked as witnesses. And even the structure of the covenants, when he compares the ancient Near Eastern covenants between kings and people, and the covenant at Mount Sinai between God and Israel, Klein notes all the similarities. They both start with preambles of introduction of the identity of the king is how it's introduced. I am the Lord God, a historical prologue, what God has done for them in the past. I am the Lord God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Then in those covenants, there were stipulations. This is what you must do now that I am your king. So these were the obligations for the people that they must keep. And then there were sanctions. Here are the blessings I will give you as your king if you obey the terms. If you don't rebel against me as a kingdom, I will protect you. My army will, etc. I will make sure you do not starve. But then there were the curses. If you rebel against your king, then I will crush you. I will defeat you. I will um, exile you, whatever those curses were. And Klein notes that when we come to Deuteronomy, the structure and the way the covenant unfolds wouldn't have been that new to those people. They would have seen these things growing up in Egypt and hearing stories of ancient kings that God used a common covenant um, treaty and the way they unfold before. And so in that sense, Klein is not suggesting it, and this is a common criticism, as you know, that Klein develops his covenant theology from studying the ancient pagan world. Right. And therefore, Klein assumes that if it was done that way in the ancient world, then that's how we must understand the scriptures. Anyone who's actually sat under Klein in class knows that's not his argument. His argument was the works arrangement between God and Israel that was only on the national typological level was seen throughout scripture, that Paul affirmed that arrangement in the New Testament, that it's affirmed in Jeremiah 4, where it shows how, I think it's 4, but where it shows how um, the people actually walked through and pledged to obey the terms of the covenant or they would be killed. But then Klein also noted you can find the same type of thing in the ancient world. So Klein wasn't suggesting that though the scripture may not teach it, we can interpret it that way because the pagans did it. Klein taught that the scriptures show this type of arrangement, but it wouldn't have been new to them, that this was very common and God did use something that they already knew in the structure of the covenant. Let me stop and ask you for your thoughts on that. Yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, you know, in the same way that Israel would have been familiar with treaties because that was just the way diplomacy happened in the ancient Near East. Um, Klein says that, you know, even the Hebrew language is something analogous to that. God didn't make up a, a special heavenly language to, uh, reveal himself to his people in the Old Testament. He used a Semitic language that was, um, you know, grammatically and syntactically related to other Semitic languages. Um, so we shouldn't be surprised to find him, you know, using a an instrument like a covenant um, that would have been uh, very commonplace in Israel's world. Yes, and historians have noted and scholars that in the same way circumcision was likely around before Genesis 17. Right. 
that this wasn't a new idea that other nations had used it for other purposes. And so God didn't have to explain in detail what actually, how it was done, but God used it for his own holy purposes, but it was something already out there they were familiar with. And they would have been the same idea with the covenant, the way the covenant unfolds. Well, that brings us to um, Klein and goes on to say, when you look at Exodus 20 through 23, the law is being read. Uh, again, there's a preamble and identification who God is. And in Exodus 23, it's the angel of the Lord who must be obeyed to fulfill the terms of the covenant. And the angel of the Lord, of course, is the Lord. The commandments um, the added to that, it, besides the Ten Commandments, are added positive law. And again, positive law is law designed only for a specific time and place and people. And that positive law, that added law, is holy war against the Canaanites. Mm. That in the law of God, one of the things they were responsible to do as a nation is to defeat the Canaanites and wipe them out. And so, and in that section, the sanctions there are only positive. In Deuteronomy 28, they're both positive and negative. The blessings and curses is very clearly. But in this section, the sanction is that what the Lord would promise to do in the blessing. That as they fulfilled this, as they defeated the, the their enemies, um, the Lord promised to overcome their enemies. And so in Exodus 24, after the law has come, after there's a covenant between God and Israel, there's the ratification of the covenant. That's where we have the sprinkling of the blood on the people. An altar is built in Exodus 24. There's 12 pillars built representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Klein notes that this is also looking ahead, anticipating the defeat of the Canaanites. Because again, there will be an altar built this time on Mount Zion instead of there on Mount Sinai. And of course, that will be fulfilled in the new covenant or when the return of Christ, where we have in the book of Revelation, the temple, that final temple, we have the 12 tribes of Israel represented by the 12 foundations of the temple. So all this is, is looking ahead, each step in redemptive history as it's pointing to the gospel. And then finally, we have the communion meal in Exodus 24. And here we have the elders and Moses going up the mountain, sitting down and having a meal of fellowship between God and his people. Even though it's only the elders, Exodus is clear that the elders represent the people. And that we'll see that throughout the Old Testament. And so this anticipates, as we look ahead first to the Zion temple, the peace offerings. Notice in Exodus 24, they're not offering a sacrificial offering. It's more of a peace meal that God has brought them peace. And so they sit down for a meal together as they would have these meals in the temple later on. And then finally picturing, picturing the eschatological banquet of the wedding feast. Mm. And so in some senses, the, the covenant with Israel is all picturing the covenant of grace. Um, that God would bring about. Now, the very fact that it's typology means that typology will always fall short. And sometimes it'll be used more as a contrast than, than a, sort of a, an I, a identity that it's just alike. And so we'll talk more about that. But let me stop there as we've compared those middle sections of Exodus with what's coming. Yeah, I mean, not too much to add there, but I, I appreciate the point you were just making about how sometimes types are, um, I don't know, do we call them negative? I mean, I think of um, some of the worst kings that, that Israel had, and, you know, we certainly shouldn't look at them and say, oh, well, there's a type of Christ in some sort of positive way. No, actually, they're um, <laughs> they're pointing out the the antithesis of what Christ the king is like. Yeah, you can see that with David real clearly. When he defeats Goliath, he's a type of Christ. Mm -hmm. When he sins with Bathsheba, we don't want to say he's a type of Christ. We want to say he's falling short to, to make us look for a better Messiah. Right. He's failing to be a type of Christ. Yes. And the Bible really, that's a really central point in 2 Samuel, David's sin. It really stretches that section out to show us 
in many ways, David is like the Messiah that it even makes you wonder, is this the one? But if you're wondering that, then we have this whole incident with Bathsheba that in excruciating detail shows David's sin before the Lord. No, this cannot be the savior. He has his own sin problem that must be dealt with by a savior. Exactly. So yeah, it depends on how you're looking at the types. Exactly. And then you made that point. So that brings us to this section in Klein called Enthronement of the Covenant Lord. And Klein notes again, the pattern with this section of Exodus and Genesis 1. And the pattern is recreation. Because in the original account of creation, we have the defeating of enemies, which in Genesis 1 is darkness and the waters over the earth. Now, I like to say enemies is, is more of a literary way to say obstacles. Mm -hmm. They are our enemies in the sense they keep us from being able to live on this earth as, as created beings. So God defeats them in a sense. And Klein points out that it's nothing like the pagan accounts where God's actually defeated other gods and able to create the world and sometimes cut those defeated gods in half. But the way it's written as there were obstacles in the way and the great king had to take away all the obstacles. And so the pattern is, Klein says, both in creation and redemption, a slaying of an enemy and then a building of a royal house. And so what do we have in Exodus? We have the slaying of the Egyptians, which in Psalm 74, the Egyptians are called the Rahab monster, God defeating the monster. And then the building of the tabernacle, the building of God's royal house to live with his redeemed people. And so that's the pattern that we see. And of course, the tabernacle was built with Moses seeing a vision from heaven. And so build God's heavenly house that you see, build a replica of it on the earth. And what Moses sees, he then has written down or writes down uh, to be followed. And so... In creation, after on the seventh day, God rests on his throne. And after the tabernacle is built, God rests on his throne. This time, as he fills the throne, fills the throne room with his smoke, which is a picture of his Holy Spirit. And so again, we have this creation, new creation motif going on. And that, of course, is fulfilled with his church. God redeems us. Uh, through the cross and resurrection of Christ. And then when we believe he, his spirit lives inside us, we become his temple. And so Klein notes a few other examples of this motif of creation, recreation that comes about in the people of Israel. In Exodus 12, 2, the Israelites are told, start your new year at the Passover week. In other words, that, that is now to account for how you account the seasons. Your year starts commemorating the time that you were redeemed. So the idea is that God's people become a picture of his new creation. Something new has begun. Another example is the glory cloud is hovering over God's people. Deuteronomy 32.10, we have that Hebrew word for um, that hovering again. And then, of course, Genesis 1-2, the Holy Spirit is hovering over the original Eden and the original creation. And so another example, in Genesis 1, light and dark is separated. And with Israel, Israel is separated from Egypt throughout the plagues, especially the darkness in Exodus 10. Egypt is in darkness, but Israel is in the light. And again, the Red Sea divides. Um, they make it through the sea on dry land, but the waters overcome the Egyptians. And so all these are creation, recreation motifs that Israel's redemption, Israel's being brought out of the Red Sea into the mountain is a picture of the new creation. And at the end of both, God builds a cosmic house. The first one, of course, is a picture of the cosmic house, the tabernacle. And with us, we are the true cosmic house. We are the new Jerusalem. He is building his temple. A couple other examples. Uh, the divine fiats of Genesis 1. Moses could have written that God simply created light, 
separated, that he simply did it. But we, Moses wants us to hear the divine fiat. He wants us to hear the king speaking with his kingly power. And then when we come to the building of the tabernacle, God is building his house where he'll live. This time, it reads very much like creation again, that the fiats are, let this be done, or this will be done after God's pattern. The, the, the language is, is, again, a king building his kingdom. And then at the end, it says in Exodus, and so Moses finished the work. And Klein says, you should immediately think of Genesis 2.2. God finished the work of his original creation. And now Israel pictures a new creation. And then finally, um, if Adam was to obey the covenant of works and fulfill the covenant on our behalf, he would have entered that place of eternal rest with God and, and seeing God face to face. He would have been glorified. We all would have been glorified. And yet what happens when Moses goes up the mountain, his face shines with the image of God. The glory of God is on his face. Picturing when Christ returns, we will actually see God's glory and we will shine uh, the reflection of God's glory. And so everything is looking ahead and picturing the new creation that Christ would bring. And then finally, we'll end with this, the Sabbath motif. Um, the creation account uh, returns in the fourth commandment. The reason you are to work and then rest is because that was God's pattern at creation. And so God rests at the end of um, Genesis 2. And then he rests again after the tabernacle is built. And he enters his throne room with that smoke and he rests. And, and there's even verses in the Old Testament that when God enters his, his throne room in the temple, it's God at rest. I think there's one of that in Isaiah 66. And so that's just another example of Israel is construed and pictured as the final new creation of God. Now, then we go back to your point that where it falls short, we learn that something better must come. We need a better mediator than Moses. We need a better redemption than simply from Pharaoh physically. We, better, we need a better mountain than the earthly mountain. And we need a better covenant where we don't have to pledge to keep the law in order to attain it. Everything is pointing to something better and looking ahead to what Christ would do through the gospel. Amen. Now I'll get your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I mean, so much here in this section. Um, I like that that Klein goes to the Sabbath because thematically that's what happens after God finishes his work in Genesis two is that, uh, he enters his Sabbath rest. But, you know, I also thought as you were uh, discussing that, that Proverbs eight fits in here well too, because, um, it's almost like, uh, God's own commentary on Genesis one, where in Proverbs eight, we have, uh, wisdom personified as sort of the builder. I mean, I was hearing that theme come out a lot in what you were saying is that God is building, uh, he's building his creation, he's building his tabernacle. Well, wisdom personified talks about being the builder that's there with God, constructing this uh, creation that God is is building. Yes, yeah, I, I, and I'm trying to think where Klein, he developed Psalm 8 somewhere in his writings of what you said, but I I can't remember where, I'm sure some of our listeners know it might be in kingdom prologue but uh, i'll see if i can find that for the show notes okay and i think then we'll close with the thought that whenever you're teaching the old testament whenever you're teaching about israel always know that that's temporary and provisional and pointing us forward and so we always have to end up in the new covenant and then we have to ask ourselves how does this picture things that remain how does this picture things that are contrasted? How does this picture Christ? Um, what aspect of the law is moral and remains as our standard? What aspect is typological or ceremonial? In every aspect, we have to remember that the new covenant fulfills the old. 
or as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, these things happen for us, for our instruction, unto the, who the end, is, end of the ages has come. We are the new Israel. Everything is pictured here. Now, as an exegete, you have to do the work and see how the New Testament uh, fulfills the old and explains it. Yeah, um, like you said, that's not... Uh, it's not. It's often complicated. Certainly not easy. Um, but as Christians who are members of the New Covenant, uh, that is governed by the New Testament, um, it it is um, a worthwhile project to look at the Old Covenant that was governed by the Old Testament and to figure out how we relate to what we read there. I mean, it's the bulk of our Bibles. Yes. Amen. Well, did we reach a a stopping point? We did. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I really appreciated that discussion. Um, thank you for organizing that. I enjoyed it too. Thank you. All right. We would love to hear what you think about this. So please do email us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com. You can tweet at us. I am at Machen Guy. Todd is at T Bordeaux. The podcast itself is at Glory Cloud Pod. Um, I'm also on Instagram as at Machen Guy. But you can also join the discussion over at the Meredith Klein Facebook group. Just let the admins know that you listen to the podcast and they can get you added. And Todd and I will be back again with more of Chapter 10 of God, Heaven, and Armageddon.